Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there, welcome back. Please do subscribe both channels, EE Arts, and also on Evolutionary Energy Arts. Each one has unique videos. And sometimes we jump back and forth on the topics. We try to go a little more spiritual on EE Arts, but uncover mysteries there, and we cover what's going on in the world on Evolutionary. But, you know, there's a lot of mysteries that we've covered on Evolutionary. Uh, over the years, Evolutionary probably has had 2,000 videos uploaded to it at minimum. And do check out some of the playlists because there's all sorts of different topics that are are covered in there. <clears throat> so, two, astrophotographers have captured the most ridiculously detailed photo of the moon ever. So they say, and there you have it. What is your thoughts? What is your feelings? What are your feelings, I should say, with this? Well, in a, in a particular density, it does feel very, very tangible, but I can't say it's actually this density. Yeah, and so for some people that went over heads, I'm sure. Um, for others, you get what we're saying. You know, what is the reality of the moon itself? That is a big, big question. We've talked about this before. I've done at least half a dozen videos talking about what really is going on with the moon. Is it a hollowed out spaceship? Has it always been here? Was there ever a time it wasn't here? How did it get here? Listen to Buzz Aldrin. This is somebody that supposedly went to the moon. He's talking to a little girl. Let's listen to his words here. Okay, Zoe, no, favorite. What is your favorite thing about space? Go in there. Go in there. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and... And that's the way it happened. And, and if it didn't happen, it's nice to know why it didn't happen. So in the future, if we want to keep doing something, we need to know why something stopped in the past that we wanted to keep it going. What do you make of his answer there? So he, he basically, now you could say, well, is he suffering from a little Alzheimer's? Does he have some dementia? Is his brain glitching? Or did he mean to say exactly what he said? And uh, let's listen one more time, guys. Because we didn't go there, and, and that's the way it happened. He's, he does sound a little bit like uh, 46 right now. He's sounding a little bit like J.B., he, sa he said, well, because we didn't go there, and that's the way it happened. We didn't go there. Which is a very, very curious answer, and I think the whole issue that he's running into is he doesn't know how to explain what went on in 3D terms where people could really understand what happened. So I do see someone who has information that he's not able to expose or explain, but he's doing the best he can. Yeah, fascinating response. And then also the question is, why did we not go back there? It, you know, just that question. What, or why didn't we go there in the first place? Very interesting, is it not? What do you guys make of that? little statement there so here they take it as just simply admitting the moon landing was fake oh you know there's a lot of fake stuff that they send you know send us give us expose us to but what happens is people will say well they'll make a statement like well space is fake fake there's nothing else but us and there they 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 just couldn't be getting farther from the truth and so there is actually a hollow moon hypothesis. It was said that some of the first astronauts that landed, when they put their feet on it, when the lander hit it, it rang like a bell. So there is a whole hollow moon hypothesis. And it, it goes way, way back. 
you see here between 69 and 77 seismometers installed on the moon by Apollo missions recorded moon quakes. The moon was described as ringing like a bell during some of these quakes, specifically shallow ones. This phrase was brought to popular attention in March 1970 in Popular Science. November 20th, 1969, Apollo 12 deliberately crashed the ascent stage of its lunar module onto the moon's surface. NASA reported the moon rang like a bell for almost an hour. Why are they saying this is the question. And then you have people saying, you know, this was obviously, this is a hollowed out alien ship. You know, there's a lot of interesting mythos about the moon. And we've touched on this before. Many ancient peoples spoke about a time before the moon was in the sky. Aristotle, Democritus, Anaxagoras, Apollonius of Rhodes, Hippolytus, and more. Now we know that the moon is not what we see. Uh, this person, this person's interesting. They, they actually got something big there. That a holog hologram hides the true body behind it. Who is? Oh, this is Tellinger. That's right. I, I didn't even notice whose article it was I pulled up as I was just wanting to get somebody that t spoke about the time before the moon was in the sky. So, yeah, Michael Tellinger's done a lot of work uh, in researching, well, the Anunnaki for one. And you got to ask yourself, why is there always a Wikipedia that pops up when you talk about chemtrails, when you talk about Oh, you know, the plague upon the land and the cures for it. You always get a wiki. You know, hey, for official knowledge, you better go here to the official site, the official source. Well, why do they, if, if, if the Anunnaki is just basically a myth, then why don't they give you the same Wikipedia for, you know, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Celtic mythology, Norse mythology? You know, Native American mythologies, Australian Aborigin, they don't. Only the Anunnaki. Only the Anunnaki. That should really tell you something. It is very, very, very telling. Unfortunately, some people just kind of glaze right past it, and they don't even understand that it's a, it's a way that the controllers are tattling on themselves. You know, in some ways, it makes me think that it's it's AI related because, again, AI did not originate on this planet. AI has existed long before uh, we were here and, and long before perhaps many other beings have come here. So, again, when we're talking about AI, we're not referring to what's going on in the U.S., in China, in Russia, in creating something new. No, no, no. We're talking about something much, much more ancient. Fascinating how all these things tie together. And, and here is what Michael Tellinger says, that it's a hologram that hides the true body behind it. And we agree. And I've shared with you guys, I've actually seen it where the hologram gets turned off. Uh, all these little craters, all this amazing, you know, resolution just it just became like a blank white canvas total white canvas and i saw this and somebody else saw it with me we looked at each other at kind of saying what the bleep but it was wonderful to experience because yeah it did show the true nature here does that mean there's nothing there oh there's something there but again when we talk about nibiru the home of the Anunnaki beings. We're talking about something that lies on fourth density. And, you know, it's just outside the visible spectrum of most people. There are those that could perceive it. And there are those that maybe perhaps have actually caught glimpses of it because of their own ability. Their own ability to perceive things in other densities than 3D. And many people have this ability and actuality uh, most, if not all of us, would have it if it wasn't for the food we're eating, the energies and frequencies we're exposed to, the water we're drinking, the air we're breathing, mm -hmm. and the indoctrination that we receive. Definitely the indoctrination and all the traumas because all the information we need to know about the universe is all inside of us. As above, so below. We have the ability to read any energy that's out there but we've been taught from a very young age that there is 
on the outside of you only these 3D tangible things. So that's we were never taught how to use these things. Currently, we get that the moon is somewhere outside the orbit of Uranus. Um, the moon, I should say. Nibiru is outside the orbit of Uranus. The moon, like Nibiru, are of the same density. So the moon is actually something that is fourth density. So it would not be truly perceived by us. So, But there is a fourth density moon in the sky around us that is still affecting us. But this holograph is is basically superimposed on top of it. So it's pretty fascinating to see this. That does mean that, you know, it's all basically, it's a script, it's a production, it's a Hollywood movie, what we're seeing from NASA. Yes, again, they, they're feeding us certain things to get certain reactions out of us and also to to basically shape our reality. That's the most important thing is for them to feed us our own reality so they can keep us in, in their control. It's like putting a harness on a, on a horse. You know, once you have that part of everything under control, you control the rest. Democritus and Anaxagoras taught that there was a time when the earth was without the moon. And that was the time when the earth had calm weather. When we could go back to uh, the Garden of Eden and man didn't have to strive to have food because everything was in balance. The moon has a tilt. I mean, the moon has a tilt. The earth has a tilt. This is what sets Vedic astrology apart from Western astrology is that Vedic astrology takes into account the tilt of the axis of the earth. That axis of the earth is because of the moon and everything that happened in that time frame of when the moon was brought here. The, really, it, it's geoengineering of the, of the greatest kind is what you have going on. The moon being here, now science will tell you that there would be no life here without the moon because it gives us the tides and the natural flow of things. Uh, yeah, no, it's exactly the opposite as they always give us pretty much the exact opposite of the truth. As many people are awakening to the reality of what's going on with the plague upon the land and the truth there about the cure. And exactly how that is something that is back assward, we could say. Well, it's the same thing. This is when the time before the moon was there was the time when the moon when the earth was upright on its axis. Weather was gentle. Uh, the earth provided ample food in a very, very easy manner. The reason that it's here is to create all this strife, all the hardship, all the louche, which, you know, is again the negative emotion based energy put off by beings when they're suffering. So it's pretty fascinating to see these ancient accounts of a time with a, that the earth didn't have the moon. Aristotle wrote that Arcadia in Greece before being inhabited by the Hellenes, or the Greek peoples themselves, had a population of Pelagians, Pelag Pelagians, I should say, and that these Aborigines occupied the land already before the moon was in the sky above the earth. So they were actually called proselenes because of that. Apollonius of Rhodes mentioned the time when not all the orbs were yet in the heavens before the Danai and Deucalion races came into existence, and only the Arcadians lived, of whom it is said that they dwelt on the mountains and fed on acorns before there was a moon. And those races are very, very interesting as well. Plutarch wrote in the Roman questions, there were Arcadians of Evanders following the so-called pre-lunar people. Similarly, wrote Ovid, the Arcadians are said to have possessed their land before the birth of Jove, and the folk is older than the moon. Jove, Jupiter, Zeus. And when we look at these Olympian gods, they are connected absolutely with the same beings that we're talking about when we're talking about the Anunnaki. Not all beings, though, should be lumped into the same category. And this is where some make the mistake of saying, 
you know, all these ancient myths of all these different beings, they're all Anunnaki. No, they're not all Anunnaki. They're not all coming from, maybe we should say Nibiruans. Maybe they're not all Nibiruans. There are many different beings that have come here. See, the why Earth has so many different types of humanoid races is simply that there's many different humanoid species that have come to Earth from other places. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just so many mysteries that it would be impossible to uncover everything. But I think that's one of the things that's really fun about going through an awakening is you learn all of these different things about the way things are and the way things aren't. Yeah, interesting. Job 25, 20, 25, 5, the grandeur of the Lord. And again, that word is is always taken from a different word. Lord is a very generic word, generic. Uh, the original translation, the oldest original translation is Elohim, again, plural, mighty ones. So the grandeur of the Lord who makes peace in the, he and the heights is praised and the time is mentioned before there was a moon and it did not shine. And Psalm 72, 5, it is said, Thou wasted, thou wast feared, since the time of the sun and before the time of the moon. A generation of generations. A generation of generations means a very, very long time. It's interesting to see as well. And, you know, there, there's many people have caught that there's two creation stories uh, in the Bible and that there seems like there was a creation and then there was a destruction and then there was a recreation. And yes, you know, there, there, that is more in line with reality. And what we have gotten again is that Earth now, it was Tiamat. Tiamat, well, you know, Marduk again. Marduk is one of the sons of Enki, a Nibiruan, we should say, Anunnaki Nibiruan, who fought against Tiamat, who is represented as a dragon, Coincidentally, interestingly enough, again, everything from the victors, the victors write the history and they rewrite it and they rewrite it from their point of view. So when we look to the Sumerian mythologies, again, much, much older than anything biblical, they're still written from the victors point of view. They're still written from the controllers point of view. And so they slay Tiamat which was the old system, the old planet. And what we have gotten when you see the, you know, the asteroid belt, that's part of Tiamat. And that's actually was when you put it together with Earth and some other particles that are no longer anywhere, um, but blasted into oblivion, that made up Tiamat. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't know this before, but that's also n known as the Great Rift. Yeah, there are legends of it being called the Great Rift by many indigenous people. And, you know, they know it's scars of a battle in the sky. So when you look up and you see what I always thought was just looking into the densest part of the Milky Way galaxy with just more stars. No, you're actually looking at debris from intergalactic battles that are going on. They all talk about wars in the heavens. I mean, you know, there we go. Mm. Mm, mm. Yeah, and the dragon of old. And again, it's so fascinating how the truth is right there, but again, it's distorted. It's distorted for the masses. Yeshua, Jesus, the Latinized version of his name, but again, his, his people that knew him in his life, they never referred to him as Jesus. They referred to him as Yeshua. When we look to a lot of his teachings, one of the things that he said when he was confronting the religious um, powers that be of this time, he said, you don't serve my God. You know, you don't serve that that I serve. You serve the adversary. Again, anything that is given to us in mass is from the adversary. If the adversary, again, which is the literal translation of Satan, controls the world, it's pretty obvious that your mainstream media is going to be part of the satanic you know, version of things. We've waken up to that. 
But then you have to say, well, what about what's given to us in our mainstream religion, like the Bible and the Koran? Most, that's the first and that's the third most published books of all time. They're written by the victors. They're rewritten. There is truth in there. Absolutely. You can find certain references, certain truths. But again, it's distorted by the victors. It's, it's the mainstream religious media that we have. So it's fascinating to see all this. And, you know, I, I've had some people that just can't understand uh, because they only view it from the indoctrination that they've received that there could be truth in something when the main core of it is all about distortion. But sure, th that, that is something that, that is obviously the a good reason to learn how to discern on the highest level. And you could discern from a logical point of view by comparing mythologies all around the world. The Tuatha Dé Danann, we've talked about this before, were they Irish gods or aliens? What were they, these beings? It's, it's little wonder that the Tuatha Dé Danann, the tribe of the gods, were mistaken as stuff of nonsense. But we as mere mortals today can make our own conclusions. So there's many different people. And if you look to the myths of Ireland, there's successive waves of people that come. And the Tua, Tua de de Danan or Tuatha de Danan is translated as the tribe of Danu. Scholars are agreed that Danu was the name of their goddess. Most probably some are equating it with Anu, Anan. Now, you know, there's there's disagreement as well, as well here. But it's fascinating to see that there are claims in the Book of Invasions, for instance, circa 1150, claims in a poem that they came to Ireland riding in flying ships surrounded by dark clouds. They landed at a particular area where they brought a darkness over the sun lasting three days. Wow, when Jesus was... You know, put on the cross, the legend goes the sun was dark for three days. Isn't that interesting? Yes, we got to keep going a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. And, you know, resist the temptation because of programming to say, oh, this is all just distortions of Satan. Da, 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 I can't hear you. Because that's exactly what the controllers don't want you to understand is the fact that all this does go together. And again, there is a creator. There's absolutely a benevolent creator. Many people, my mother, for instance, would say, I don't, I don't like the Old Testament. That God's nasty. He's vengeful, vindictive. He tells people to slaughter other people. He condones slavery. Uh, I, I, you know, I have nothing to do with that. I just, I read little excerpts from the Beatitudes. I focus on what Jesus says himself, and I just kind of don't look at the rest of it because I'm not sure I really like it. That was kind of how my mother's point of view was on it. And you could clearly see why when you, when you study it, you know, from head to toe, because yes, in Jericho, and Jericho is a fascinating thing to talk about too, because there's leftover technology there that had to be destroyed. There was a lot of leftover technology and evidence of the fact that of extraterrestrial interdimensional beings in, uh, well, Saddam Hussein's new Babylon, right, Iraq, and also in uh, Syria, and also in Afghanistan, and in the area of Pakistan that's been massively flooded right now, too. This, there's... There's always the victors, quote unquote, the controllers, working to eradicate the real history of what's gone on. You know, and what I see happening is we're all changing our vibration. We're all moving into a place where we really, truly want the truth. And we want that regardless. We need to feel the truth. And in that, that's where our strength lies in understanding what we've been taught and looking at things through different lenses very important so if you look at things through the lens of technology that maybe it's technology then your views can start changing and you can start finding some some examples of this isn't quite what i thought it was it wasn't really what i was taught about and that's where you can start to question and open your mind up 
So, you know, the pagan legends, which are older than the Christian legends, you know, basically had the Tuatha de Danann come in here, or come into Ireland, we should say, in flying ships. And then the Christian monks rewrote it, rewrote it as coming in sailing ships. Ah, yeah, of course, that's the way it goes. This is part of why they even have these religions to leave the, lead the way, so to speak. Again, 65 million to 100 million indigenous people in North and South America were wiped out by the Europeans that came in and then spread their version of Christianity all through both continents. They come in, they conquer, they put in an economic system, they give ideology, they tell you what you're going to believe, and you eventually get assimilated. And all the real history gets wiped away. Wiped away. Interesting, too. What did these guys look like? What did the Tuatha de Danann look like? They certainly looked very different to the small, dark native peoples of Ireland at that time. The de Danann are generally described as tall, with either red or blonde hair, blue or green eyes, and pale skin. Very Nordic looking. And, you know, the, oh gosh, uh, Robert Seffer, Atlantean Gardens, does a lot of good work in showing that these people show up all over. When you look at Egyptian mummies, 1400 BC, blonde hair, Nordic features. Uh-huh. Yeah, because some people will say, you know, that these, these famous um, pharaohs and the like, they had to be what we would perceive as, as somebody uh, of African, modern African descent, but it wasn't the case. Now, again... There's been waves of different beings that are very, very human-like come and interact with the planet and settle here. Settle here. And, you know, sometimes there was war, sometimes conflict, sometimes peace. It's fascinating. But, you know, what's also fascinating, and, and we've done several videos on the Tuatha de Don, and here somebody's basically saying the Nephilim, Celtic giants of old, now, again, I think that one of the biggest disservices you could do is just view things only from a biblical lens because that's, again, like viewing things only from the lens of MSNBC or Fox News or CNN. you got to go a little bit deeper. You have to do comparative study and then also meditate on it. Learn how to allow the mind to quiet and see what inspirations come through. But, you know, again, this is just fascinating. And then when we talk about the goddess Danu, and we discovered Danu was the Celtic mother goddess, an ancestral figure, matriarch, namesake, namesake of the Tuatha de Danann. Then there's also, though, interestingly enough, Danu, a Hindu primordial goddess. See the parentheses, Asura. Again, we were talking about the wars of the Asuras and the Devas. Well, the Asuras are the ones that are basically equated uh, w with a more demonic edge. And again, we could say more in lines with service to their selves. These are the beings that were actually at war with uh, the Devas in an eternal battle of, you know, good versus darkness and, you know, light versus darkness that goes on. So, Danu... Uh, a Hindu primordial goddess mentioned in the Rig Veda. She's the mother of the Danavas. And the, in Hindu mythology, the Danavas are a race descending from Kashapa and his wife Danu, a daughter of the progenitor god Daksha. It's mentioned that there are 100 Danavas. They're a mythological race of demigods. Demigods. What does that really mean? Again, what we're talking about is yes, these beings are humanoid because you wouldn't be able to interbreed if they weren't humanoid. If they were absolutely purely of a higher vibrational frequency and non-physical to our realm, they wouldn't be able to breed. So these are humanoid beings that are not from here. They, they are humanoid beings that have higher technology. And this should not negate the fact that there is also various beings inside the planet right now to this day and also under the oceans that are intentionally keeping themselves from us uh, seeing them. Mm -hmm.
it's really important that they stay out of sight, out of mind, because there's a narrative that needs to play out for their, well, to their advantage. And since they do have a high uh, control of the technologies and um, control over what we read, what we see, um, our belief systems, and understanding that our belief systems are, well, that's our core. That's our everything. That's that's what we think in our ego that keeps us alive or can harm us. You know, that's very, very important. And they know all that. Oh, boy, it gets more and more interesting, too. So this little relief here is showing Matsya slaying Adanova. And so Matsya, who is Matsya? Well, Matsya is the fish avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu. Hmm. A fish man avatar of the creator god Vishnu. Isn't that curious? Described as, um, you know, part man, part fish. And there's other depictions of these beings. Now, these beings are basically regarded as benevolent. And we could look at other ones, too. And, in fact, the Hindu version of the Great Flood has Matsya, or actually, at first, it's a fish, that goes to the Hindu Noah, whose name is Manu, man, you, you, man, Manu, you, man. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, all these connections are all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look to some of these uh, Hindu legends, for instance, uh, they speak of the Sarasvati River. And the Sarasvati River now we know from science was there it was massive it was way bigger than the ganges way way much much wider uh, this thing was many kilometers many miles wide and now it's basically dry dry desert river <laughs> what, what used to be a riverbed but it's just dry desert but we know from satellite photos it is exactly where the legends say it was and you know again we could go into huge so many what you would call uh, coincidences? N no, not a coincidence. So anyway, Vishnu shows up as a fish, disguised as a fish, and Manu is, again, like Noah. He's a good guy. He's somebody that is, is trying to, what we would call, live a high-vibe life, trying to be a good person, basically, at the core. And so... He knows that there's going to be a flood, and he warns them, just like the Noah story, just like uh, Utnapishtim over in the Sumerian stories, which are, again, 1,500 to 2,000 years older than anything biblical. It's, it's the exact same story again. Now, when we look at these beings, now, the, the thing is, what do we call an avatar? Well, these bodies are avatars. The body is something that's temporary. Uh, it, it's it's what you get into to experience the ride of the 3D world. And and that's another thing that we need to think about is that we extend, we expand much further than just this 3D realm. Our being is able to travel, travel through different densities. You know, when we they talk about space travel and they talk about traveling to different worlds, we do not need to have uh, external vehicles to do that because all of the information we need lies right inside of us just waiting to be unlocked waiting to be utilized and if we were taught these things from a very very young age how to use these abilities then uh, things would be a lot different absolutely so you know we look into the mythology of Owans and again you could even look and, and, and find this is why the Pope has the Pope hat. It, it goes way, way back to here. The earliest instructor of man in letters, sciences, and arts. Now, people will say, okay, well, this is the Book of Enoch. This is some of those fallen angels. But again, angel, what's the word translate to? Messenger. A messenger of the gods. You know, again, these are beings. And... We are looking at things that are extraterrestrial and interdimensional because we ourselves go through different densities. Man is an interdimensional being. Well, that is our normal state of being. Again, when we have a calcified pineal gland, then we, we start to lose some of our ability. So it's interesting. You know, th this 
Oans, also known as Adapa and Uana, was a Babylonian god from 4th century BC. He peered out of the ocean every day as a fish human creature to share his wisdom with people along the Persian Gulf. As we said, to this day there are people living in cities under the oceans. Mm, that's another thing that's really difficult to to comprehend, but it's it's definitely true. And there is a lot of stories if you look about um, it's not UFOs, but the submersible vehicles. That that's a real thing. That's something that has been seen and reported even through our own military. You know, the, these are inscriptions that are many many thousands of years old many many thousands these guys look to be basically flying around and you know down here on the ground they're like hey hey what's up guys you got a nice view up there well don't mind that this guy looks like a pope that's half half fish and half human with a pope hat on and there looks to be some little gray alienish figure over there you know, again, this is all stuff that was well known. It's been rewritten out of our history. Absolutely rewritten. Mythological demigods. In reality, it should say, you know, a race of uh, hybrid humans with other beings. These are humanoid beings. Interesting. We have this best UFO picture ever, the Calvine photo found after 30 years missing. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't really feel so real. Or it, at best, this might be something that is is made um, by humans in an imitative way. That's what it feels like. It feels very 3D, very um, created possibly in somebody's garage. So, again, the ant people, the Hopi people, are one of the Native American tribes descended from the ancient peoples who lived in the southwest of the U.S., which is called the Four Corners, and, and we spent a good amount of time living in, in that area. Um, and we actually, you know, lived on tribal lands. One of the groups of ancient people of the Pueblo was the mysterious Anasazi, the ancients who mysteriously flourished and disappeared between 550 and 1300 years after Yeshua. The history of the Hopi goes back thousands of years, one of the oldest cultures in the world. And it gets into the original name of the Hopi, which was Hopitu Shinumu, which means the peaceful people. Concepts of morality and ethics are deeply rooted in Hopi tradition. And this, is, this implied a respect for all living things. Traditionally, they lived according to the laws of the creator, Masa. The Hopi believed that the gods arose from the ground in contrast to other mythologies. Arose from the ground. Uh, interesting, is it not? Other mythologies had they came from the sky. This mythology suggests that ants populated the heart of the earth. Well, were they ants or were they ant-like beings is the question. And so there's many names for the true creator of this universe. And again, you know, the, the longer and the deeper we go into uh, discovering how things have been put together, then it starts to become a little bit more obvious that, again, history is written by the victors. And so we can see uh, that just like with the three pyramids over in Giza, there's an alignment that the Hopi people had as well with their mesas. Uh, that was, again, showing the importance of the Belt of Orion. And a lot of cultures actually make reference to this. Mm -hmm. Many, you know, and, and, and it's just really common for Native Americans to talk about entities that come from space. They come from heaven to earth and assist them in learning how to grow, learning how to uh, accumulate, make themselves comfortable, learning how to create a different way, a better way of living. And they're very, uh, a lot of them, there was, there was a lot of peace between them. I'm looking at these spirals you know th and time is much more like a spiral we're taught in the west that time is linear and in fact time is an illusion science will tell you created by our brains uh because that's the only way our brains can make sense of everything is is making it in a linear form uh where it's it's more of a spiral and in fact it may be very very much just like a dna helix here you see a spiral emanating from 
the center of a palm. Now, there's major chakras on the center of our palms that we use when we're doing energy work, trying to help people heal, sending them energy. Ever wonder why people in prayer services will lift up their hands? Why did Moses put his hands up? And you remember the famous barrel, battle between Moses and the uh, magicians of the Pharaoh and other, other times. And Moses actually turned his, his staff into a serpent and it ate the other ones. Yes, they were doing magic. Moses was doing magic too. His was condoned. The other ones weren't. Again, politics, 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 politics. And again, that revisionist history that we have. So there's also instances when the Israelites went to battle. And as long as Moses' arms were up in the air, they were winning. When they started to drop and he was no longer putting his palm out, uh, then the battle would start to go the opposite, opposite way and they would start to lose. So you see these emanations coming out. When we look to many statues as well, we'll, we'll see references to this. Mm -hmm. You know, all of this information has been carved in stone. And I think a lot of even those things that are carved in stone, I feel there was a technology that was able to do that. But these beings didn't uh, create um, statues like this for no reason. They created statues like this because those were the people that they revered and considered to be godlike, that had a lot of abilities that humans don't and I believe in the golden age a lot of these beings uh, were here physically here to 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 help lead to help teach for mankind to continue to grow so when we see this why is Ganesha's palm up facing whoever he is looking at how about Lakshmi both palms up how about Buddha and we were giving reference to Moses. And, you know, it's because they're sending energy. So they're sending energy in the form of a blessing. And again, energy, well, can be utilized for many different things. Can be energi uh, energized and sent in order to heal. It could be used in battle for other reasons, totally. So again, we when we look a little bit deeper, we start to understand the why behind so many things that we just w were taught to leave as well that's just a divine mystery we're not meant to understand it well that's why yeshua taught in parables to the masses but he talked openly to the inner circle of the mysteries mm -hmm. you know and he came here to teach many other things that what we could do with these body in a in a different dimensional way he came here to teach that but he couldn't teach it straight out he had to be very careful so here you see the Hopi dressed up like the ant people. Why? Well, because they're giving thanks, because they saved us. The ant people saved us. Who are these mysterious ant people? In Hopi traditions, there are time cycles similar to Aztec mythology and others, many, many, many others. They believed that at the end of each cycle, the gods would return. We're currently going through the fourth world, as they call it, or the next cycle. However, what is interesting in the cycles is the third during which the Hopi talk about flying shields. Flying shields. The world of the fourth cycle achieved an advanced civilization that was finally destroyed by God, Sotuknang, nephew of the creator, with great floods, similar to how many other traditions describe it. Isn't that interesting? So that's not the same as the creator, uh, Man Mansa, or Manasa, Masa, Masa. So it's a different, you know, being that did the destruction here. They're saying it was a nephew. Great floods. You know, there's anywhere between 450 and 650 universal flood stories on the planet. Basically, every culture talks about this. Every single culture talks about this. It's just universal. Fascinating, too. By describing how advanced the third world was, advanced flying shields were developed with the ability to attack cities far away. Hello! This is going back to the Vimanas that we were talking about. They are in agreement. 
So the Hopi of the American Southwest are in absolute agreement with the Vedic tales. And this is what we were talking about in the arts, the ancient and ongoing wars of the gods and their ships, the Vamanas, flying cities. And so we put that up over there. We, we cover how we go through the yugas. And, I mean, these ships, people saw them all the time. What was that in the sky? Oh, that, that was just Ravenna. Yeah, I'm glad he didn't stop. He's a total butthead. Yeah, they, they knew these beings by their ships, by the type of aircraft that they were in. And they, they knew that they were not all the same. They were, some were, were benevolent, some were malevolent. All different types of aircraft. And they talk about the wars that went on over their heads. So, are there angels? Well, there are beings that you would classify as angels, which are not 3D physical. At times, can appear to people uh, that are in, the people themselves that are in a 3D form can perceive them, often as a being of light or a being with a light body. And then there are what we would call angels that are really just extraterrestrials, and then there are interdimensionals that are able to lower and raise their, their frequency so that they can appear and disappear. And there's mythologies all over the world that talk about this, too. So, yeah, flying shields. We're talking about the Vimanas, these ships that could attack cities far away. They could travel rapidly between different locations on the world. So the similarity to what we think of today as flying discs or advanced aircraft is astonishing it's because it is the so-called first world was apparently destroyed by fire possibly some kind of volcanism asteroid attack or coronal mass ejection the second world was destroyed by ice ice glaciers or changed in the poles and during these two global cataclysms the virtuous members of the hopi tribe were guided by a strangely shaped cloud during the day and a moving star at night hello guys where have we heard that before? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really interesting things that if you just simply change that lens, if you twist that lens a little bit through the perspective of a technology, because we know so many things now have have been given to us and shown to us as technology. But then in the in the ancient books, in the ancient scripts, it was considered, you know, messages from uh, God. Exodus 13:21 and the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud to guide their way by day and a pillar of fire to give them light by night. Hello. I mean, it how more obvious can you get? It's just it's right there in front of us. So the ant people escorted the Hopi to their underground caves where they found shelter and substance. In this legend, the ant people are portrayed as generous and hardworking, giving food to the Hopi where supplies are scarce, and teaching them the merits of food storage, how to store food. According to the wisdom of Native Americans, the Hopi followed the path of peace. These words were spoken by Sotuknang, Sotuknang at the beginning of the Fourth World. And so, you know, again, you could see all these things just totally come together. And we see depictions. I mean, these depictions are, this is what they saw. So they're just sharing with us what they saw. Again, this is universal. This is universal. It's always been a case of extraterrestrials and also interdimensional beings. Congress implies UFOs have non-human origins. Yeah, it's it's a little trickle disclosure, but again, as they disclose, they're always going to give it away in a way in which it's going to allow them to maintain the power and the control. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, uh, you know, to me, uh, uh, his, his vibe is very, very much uh, one of the controllers. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I mean, you can go through these people and just sit with them for a moment and feel what's going on. But so many of these things that are put out there through people... Um, they are. They're, they're that story to keep us in their grasp. Visiting alien, aliens will have none of our biases, none of our preferences, none of our preconceived notions. They'll surely notice the very concept of truth on earth is fraught with conflicting ideologies in desperate need of objectivity. Well, yeah, we have a lot to work on. But 
you know, I replied saying, depends on the aliens. To lump them into one category is silly. To think they're all the same is very naive. Because they're not. There's all different sorts of beings. And this is what we learn from the mythologies. And if we are a, a product of multiple different, quote-unquote, tribes of extraterrestrials, you know, it's the devil on one shoulder, the, you know, the angel on the other so shoulder. So do we have some of the Sumerian uh, Anunnaki and Nibiru and DNA lineage in us? Yeah, I, it, it seems likely that we do. So some of our negative tendencies are coming from there. Uh, do we also have other lineages which we might say are more benevolent? Yes, and, and again, this is, this is again the internal conflict that we have going on. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I got to go and prepare a place for you. So what does it mean, many mansions? And what is his father's house? Well, I mean, look at the size of the universe that we know. The size of the universe that we know is, is gigantic. Is that not the father's house? Are these not all rooms? How many stars are, are there? We don't know, but they say there's trillions upon trillions and probably even more than what we even conceive. Of which, again, now we, we know that the majority of these actually do have planets that are circling them. The chances of there being no other life out there is zero. It, it, it's not the case at all. All you got to do is go into the mythologies and you'll see the truth of this or go into meditation and you'll know the truth as well. And so, you know, 100 million stars in the average galaxy, countless, countless galaxies. You're talking hundreds of trillions. And in fact, one number they come up with is a one with like 14 zeros uh, behind it the number of galaxies in the universe, 10 trillion galaxies in the universe, multiplying that by the Milky Way's estimate, 100 billion stars. Yeah, that's a septillion. You know, that, there, life abounds. Life abounds, of course. My father's house has many, many mansions indeed. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are some really, really brilliant people on this planet and when they sit down and they sit with this they know darn good and well we're not alone they know it's impossible that we're alone yet they will sign their names to books that claim we're alone because well they get a paycheck absolutely so as always guys thanks for your support on patreon and ko-fi check out medicinal foods link on the top of every video use coupon code EEA it does help support the channel and check out evolutionaryenergyarts.com if you need to set up a time for uh, anything from a Vedic astrology chart, which is about three to four weeks out right now, um, or energy work, spiritual coaching, that's more like two to three weeks out. Just reach out to us at evolutionaryenergyarts at gmail.com. May you be blessed by the true creator of the universe, and stay safe and prepared. Namaste. Namaste.